Thank you, Lord God. Thank you for your sweet presence of your spirit, Lord God. Thank you. We say even more, Lord God. More of your presence. More of your goodness. More of your glory. More of your faithfulness. More of your grace. More of your mercy, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. We honor you. We bless you this evening, Lord. You're the reason we're here. We thank you how you encourage us and you teach us as we come into your presence, but ultimately we're here because of you. We give you glory. We give you this evening, Lord God. We commit the entire evening to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah. Thank you, guys. I'm going to play this over here. I, um, as you guys know, we all know each other pretty well, and we cut up a lot, and I was joking today with uh, one of my friends that you guys know from um, the school here, Buddy Boyd, (laughs) and um, I I called Buddy, and I told him I was was speaking here tonight, and I asked him to pray for me. We We were very serious. And he prayed for me very genuinely. And then I started cutting up with him. I said, well, buddy, you know there's going to be some women there tonight. And I'd like for you to pray one more thing. I'd just like for you to pray that my incredible good looks wouldn't be a distraction from them, that they would miss a word. And he, and he paused for a moment. He says, the Lord says, don't worry about it. <laughs> You're okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> see, see, that was a pretty good comeback, I thought. But... Um, but it, I, I am very excited to be here with you guys. We are quite indebted to you guys in what Meg and I and so many of the people um, from the church at Greenville um, have learned here. And we know that you, you don't feel like we're indebted to you and you're not requiring anything from us. But we, we are very grateful for what we've learned here. And what we continue to learn, I feel very much at home. Um, as you know, most of you know, we have started a church, a church at Greenville, out of this church. Uh, there's a lot of good things happening. We got a building this past week, so that's really good. Um, <clears throat> probably a few months before we moved in, there's a lot of wall. Uh, the walls have to come down, that kind of thing, and we have. Um, uh, we will. We are praying for you. And, and we had um, been looking, and um, we found a place. I knew the place was unoccupied and didn't know much about it. By chance, I was in the area one day. I'd never seen any vehicles there. I saw a, a truck there. And so I uh, drove down and introduced myself, told him, that we had started a new church. We were looking at a building. Found out that he is a Gideon, you know, the Bible distributors. Of course, I caught him very much off guard. And so he did, you know, I couldn't really, I didn't get much sensing of where he's at. Caught him back in a few days. And then we arranged a meeting with him. He shared with us uh, at that next meeting where we actually, some of our leadership met with him. He said, my wife and I have been praying and uh, the building's about a little under 8,000 square feet, about 7,800 square feet. We knew we couldn't, quite honestly, at this point, it stretched us to get half of it. And I'd share with them, I said, we, we would like to get half, and, but we feel like eventually we're going to need this whole place. And we met with him that day. He said, my wife and I have been praying, and he said, we don't want anybody in here with you. The Lord's laid this on our heart that you pay us what you can for now. You take the whole building, and as your congregation grows, you increase your payments. And so, um, so that's 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 uh, just a great testimony. Um, we, like you guys, are seeing people healed, um, seeing people transformed before our eyes week after week, from one week to the next. You know, people are different. Uh, a personal testimony for Megan and myself. Brent had given me a prophecy months ago 
that as I was growing in the spirit realm, my physical eyesight was going to improve. I don't know if you remember that or not. And, I, and if, I were, if I read really fine print, I still have to wear reading glasses. And I don't like to do that when I'm teaching or preaching because I don't, I, it looks awkward to look at the congregation. And so I'm kind of constantly taking them on and off. So what I've learned is I could print my notes out. I, I, I actually use a lot of scripture, but I, I print it out, you know, copy and paste it. And I've noticed that that week by week, I'm using smaller fonts. And um, Meg had, uh, I'll be honest, I've never had my vision checked, but, you know, I just knew that I had to have the reading glasses. And um, Meg has worn glasses uh, to, for different things for quite a while. One of her eyes, uh, we know, because it had been tested, was uh, 2100. And that eye is now 2030. And she had always had to have glasses. Uh, her, her license demanded that she wore glasses to drive. And her last license renewal, they said, you, you don't have to wear your glasses anymore to drive. <laughs> so. <laughs> so that's just, those are neat testimonies for us. Um, I want to share one story from when I was in, in college. I went to North Carolina State University. You know the, the school that the colors are red like the blood of Jesus. And <laughs> but um, this is a, a story a sweet mate shared with me. And, and I, I, I'll be honest, I find it skeptical that it's true. But it was, it was circul- this story is circulated quite a bit. And a lot of the chemistry classes, physics, those type things, there were large, large auditoriums. And they would be sloped kind of like a, a theater. There might be literally 300 people in there, a sloped auditorium. The, the instructor has no clue, one person from another. You know, you just take your test, you're graded. And the story was told at the end of one semester. It was a three-hour exam. And so the, the instructor would put on the board, you know, when I was gone, he'd write two hours left. Two hours be gone, he put one hour left, and, you know, 30 minutes, 15 minutes, and as it got lower and lower, he would uh, change the time at more frequent intervals. So he got down, he said, you know, two minutes left, one minute left, call for all papers. People were just frantically, you know, trying to scribble, putting in those last few answers. He said, I want all papers now, and he was very adamant, very firm. So everybody runs up there except for this one guy, he keeps writing. And he keeps writing for several more minutes. The instructor gets all the tests together, puts them on his desk, large stack of examination papers, gets, gets to get his books together, that kind of thing. This one fella, and it's after he's called for test papers, comes up with his test. And the instructor says, sir, I'm sorry, I'm not taking your test. I called for papers almost 15 minutes ago. He said, well, don't you know who I am? He said, no, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I'm not going to show any favoritism. I don't care if you're the star basketball player, the star football player. I don't care if your dad's the chancellor. I'm not showing any favoritism. He said, seriously, you don't know who I am? And he said, no, I don't know who you are. He said, really? Uh, for, for, for real, you don't know who I am? And he said, no, I told you, I don't know who you are. I don't care who you are. I'm not taking your paper. The guy said, well, since you don't know who I am, he lifted up the stack of papers, slid his in the middle, pushed them back together and ran out of the door. But... <laughs> <laughs> but I don't. I, I'm skeptical that anyone was that bold. But that was that was one of my favorite stories from from college. I want to talk tonight uh, about the supernatural aspect of the gospel in the kingdom. I know for myself. In, in the past, whenever I'd hear the word supernatural in regard to church, I immediately thought of healing, miracle, my brace from the dead, somebody's cured of cancer, those kind of things. But what I want to, to get us to realize tonight is that we cannot, with the demands that Jesus has placed on the gospel, 
We can't fulfill any component of the gospel without supernatural power. The kingdom of God is supernatural. It's not meat or drink, right? It's not meat or drink. It's a supernatural kingdom. The gospel is a supernatural gospel. I'm going to start out in Mark 11. Start with verse 12. This is the next day when they came out from Bethany. He was hungry. After seeing in the distance a fig tree with leaves, he went to find out if there was anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. He said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. We go down to verse 20. This is the next day. It says, early in the morning as they were passing by, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots up. Then Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed is withered. I want to pay special attention to the fact that it says it was not the season for figs. So what's the deal here? Jesus had, you know, get up on the wrong side of the ground that day or what? What's it, you know, what's going on? He curses a fig tree that's not the season for figs. It would be like us being irritated in the wintertime that there's no apples on the apple tree. So what? So, so there's something more here. What's he saying? If you go on later in the chapter, it's the same section. This is the same chapter, Mark 11, where Jesus talks about saying to the mountain, be cast into the sea. And what I believe here that Jesus is saying is that there is a supernatural demand of fruit on our lives. Because of this gospel. Ezekiel 47, 12. You know, we talk all the time about the kingdom of heaven and heaven coming to earth. This is what trees will be like in the future. In heaven, the new Jerusalem. Ezekiel 47, 12. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit um, will be to eat and their leaves for the healing of the nations. In heaven, the trees always bear fruit. In the kingdom of God, we're to always bear fruit in and out of season. Matthew 11, 11 says, um, excuse me, let me back up first. Uh, Matthew 3, 1 and 2. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Matthew eleven eleven says, I assure you, among those born of women, no one greater than John the Baptist has appeared. But the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John the Baptist preached the kingdom, but never entered the kingdom. There's no recorded miracles from John the Baptist, no healings, no miracles. He preached the kingdom, but he never entered it. He never walked in the power of it. This is the position that most of the church is stuck in, the ministry of John the Baptist, talking a lot about the kingdom, but never demonstrating it. I've become amazed with this issue of the kingdom of God 
God spoke to me very clearly that when we started a church, that the first thing that I was supposed to speak on was the kingdom of God. And I realized as I began to study it how little I knew. The thing that amazed me the most is that uh, what we mainly preach is what I would call the gospel of the new birth. It's not what Jesus preached. Jesus preached the kingdom. In John 3, twice he mentions to Nicodemus about being born again. And he says, and even in that, he says, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So even in his reference to being born again, it was about the kingdom. Jesus' focus, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not, I believe the born again experience is crucial, but it's the gateway to the kingdom, it's not the end. Three times scripturally, two times in John 3, once in 1 Peter, born, the, the term born again is used. In the Gospels, the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is mentioned over 100 times. Jesus' focus was not the born-again experience as an end-all. I like how Todd White puts it. He said, God didn't, Jesus didn't so much come to get you to heaven as much as to get heaven into you. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. In my studies on the kingdom, I've become amazed that the things that God says to seek first is the thing the church knows so little about. The church really does not understand this issue of kingdom principles. And I include myself in that until recently. And I've got a lot, a whole lot to learn yet. The, you know, I've got a long ways to go. But I am at least realizing now the importance of it and how much we've missed. And, and it, it's, it really makes me sad that that the thing that he that Jesus placed that the, the scripture places so much emphasis on this, this issue of the kingdom, most of us have a very very poor understanding of. So we, uh, you know, I said that we cannot walk out this gospel without supernatural power. And there again, we, we usually say the gospel, when we think of the gospel salvation, usually when the word gospel is used in, 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 the, in the gospels, it says the gospel of the kingdom. We've, we've, we've left that off quite often. It's the gospel of the kingdom. Matthew 10, 7 and 8 says, As you go, announce this, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, Raise the dead, cleanse those with skin diseases, drive out demons. You have received free of charge, give free of charge. That's Matthew 10, 7, and 8. You agree that we cannot do that apart from supernatural power? You know, I mean, I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I, you know, I just can't raise the dead on my own. You know? Matthew 5, 27 and 28. You have heard that it is said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know that many of us, myself included, can't do this either, apart from supernatural power. I tried for years, and my own was never successful. But the power of God, oh, with God, it's possible. Matthew 6, 38, you've heard that it is said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. As for the one who wants to sue you and take away your shirt, let him have your coat as well. 
And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to the one who asks you and don't turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you. Matthew 5, 43. You've heard it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You know that we don't have the power for this apart from the supernatural power of God. Honestly, I can heal the sick on my own better than I can do some of these other things, truth be known. What God has dealt with me, we have allowed the devil to persuade us that these are theoretical issues. And, and God's been challenging me and challenging our church that, that most of us have been here theori- theoretically. We know the answers. But experientially, we're here. I talked to a couple this week. and um, That's another exciting story. He was in the hospital. He had a, a tear in his intestines. They were expecting him to be there several more weeks. There's no leak anymore. He's home. He's supposed to have another CAT scan today because the doctors are basically, this really can't be. So he's going in for another CAT scan today to confirm what the first one said. But guys, guys dealing with me, who among us would not want this lifestyle where we heal the sick, raise the dead, where we're able to love those who treat us poorly. Who among us, who among not just us, but who anywhere would not desire this type of lifestyle if they were persuaded there were someone that had the power to give it to them? And that's the catch. We haven't been persuaded that this is the life Jesus really wants for us. We haven't been persuaded that he really has the power to give it to us. We haven't been persuaded that, it, that this, these are realistic things he's talking about, not theory. This issue of grace is, is incredible. And for so long I viewed grace as the ability to forgive us when we fail, which is really more of a mercy issue. And I'm learning that grace is more the power to overcome. And grace never excuses us from fulfilling the law. It always takes us above the law. We looked at the one passage which says, the law says, don't commit adultery, but I give you a greater command. If you look a woman in lust, you've already committed adultery. The law always takes us above. It never excuses. Now, we thank God that, it, that, that the word says that if we fail, we have an advocate. And we, don't, we want to be honest about where we're at. We want to be honest about our failures. But this is an issue, too. Many people almost quote that, when I fail, I have an advocate. The word says, if you fail, you have an advocate. We don't need to enter this thing with the assumption that we will fail. Now, we admit that we don't have it together. But, you know, I talked to, I talked to someone, and, I, and they said, well, we're human, we have to fail. I said, well, what specifically do you have to fail at? So, well, you don't specifically have to fail at anything. So, well, you don't specifically have to fail then. And, and we, we have missed the boat that God desires to equip us in more than we're walking in.
the, the word says that the law came through Moses, that grace and truth came to us through Jesus Christ. He's the grace giver. He's the one that empowers us. Romans 5, 17 through 21. For if the, by the transgression of one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. So, that, so then, as through one transgression, there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through the one man's disobedience, and many were made sinners, even so, through the obedience of the one, the many were made righteous. The law came in so that transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 6.16 Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness. I felt um, that specifically that for this evening, for this group of people, that, that, that God has a word that he wants to give some truth and some revelation that will help us all to see a major area that we've been missing it. And this area is simply um, Matthew 6, 24. It says that a man cannot serve two masters. The word is very clear that we are aliens in this land. We are ambassadors here. And what God, I believe, desires to confront us with tonight is we have tried to live a dual citizenship. We, we honestly, I think for most of us, want all of him but we want it while still fitting into this culture. And the desire to fit in is robbing us of what the things that God has for us. Now, I'm certainly in no means telling you to go to work tomorrow and make stupid decisions. And you understand what I'm saying. We all know Christians that have created problems for themselves. So I'm not talking about for the sake of the gospel. I'm talking about just stupid stuff, okay? But I'm learning all the more that, that, that there are times in our life that God confronts us and he says, do you want to fit in or do you want me? Because you, you can pick one, but you can't have both. This is a major, major issue that God deals with each of us on. This life that we talked about, where we walk around healing sick, raising dead people, walking in the power to forgive those that are, that are unkind to us, this is the life that God desires for us. This should be the normal Christian life but we rarely see it demonstrated. And I think the major issue is we want that life and we still want to fit in. So we have viewed, although the word says that we will suffer persecution, we've, because of our lack of understanding, tried to do the things to eliminate persecution when it's actually the sign that we're on the right track, not off track. I um, was just really encouraged the other uh, uh, is I was actually at Walking Tuesday, 
and the Lord just gave me this message really in, I don't know, 30 minutes or so. And I, I really felt very strong. It's nice, it's cool, you know, if, if any of you speak, you know, we hopefully always feel like it's a word from God. But I really felt very strongly that this, that this message was an on-time word for you guys tonight. And I believe that there are people here, if you'll, if you'll receive this and walk in it, there's going to be a great freedom for you. And you'll begin to see the things that you have desired to happen but have been missing. You'll see those things start to fall into place. But we've tried so desperately in our own street. We've gritted our teeth and bought up our fists and I'm going to do this. And just unfortunately, it doesn't work. We know it doesn't work. We've all tried it. The word says, if you abide in me, you'll bear, you'll bear much fruit. So the, so the issue is not so much gritting our teeth and clenching our fists, but simply an issue of surrender. This issue of the kingdom, I begin to understand that the, that the, the enemy of our soul, the army of darkness, has no defense for its advances. No defense for its advancement. It has no offense to penetrate its walls. The issue is we've allowed components of ourselves to be outside of kingdom. We've lived, so to speak, with part of ourselves inside the kingdom and part out. And those, those parts that have been outside have been very vulnerable. And they've come under attack, and we've failed in those areas, myself included. And the commitment that God is desiring tonight, I think, is that we would, would just be honest with Him um, and admit that we've had issues that we haven't brought under the, you know, the issue of a, of a kingdom is that there's a king. And this kingdom does not, as I said, it does not allow dual citizenship, and it is not a democracy. Now, this has been in many ways heavy, I, I guess, and I don't mean for it to be, because this is not a message of condemnation. It's a message of freedom. Because the whole point of it is this is the life that God desires to empower us to have. It's the life that we all want, but we have tried unsuccessfully in our own strength to accomplish. So we just vow tonight to say, Lord God, I yield to you. And I yield to your power to bring these things into alignment. The world is looking for people to demonstrate the power of this gospel. And this message is for you because you're it. We, you know, the danger of here, though, or in like school, is because, let's face it, on our workplaces, most of us are the spiritually elite. Right? I mean, we're honestly, we're respected. And, you know, if they want to be prayed for for sickness, they go to us. I, mean, I don't mean this negatively about anyone else. That's just the truth. The problem is with that is because we can look good to them. We can know that we look good in a spiritual standpoint to them, but know there's issues that we're holding out on to, to Jesus. And although we might be the upper echelon spiritually speaking, in some ways. God's requiring more. He's just not content to he gets it all. He wants it all. He really does. And he's not content to he gets it all. And he's relentless.
not really sure how to close this up other than just pray for us. Lord God, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. God, we repent that we've held out on you. Sometimes in our ignorance, sometimes we just didn't understand. We didn't understand that we couldn't have you and fit in. But we understand now and we repent. And Lord God, we give to you those areas that you are tugging on us about. God, we desire this abundant life that you've talked so much about. This abundant life. We've read about it, and we've experienced it to a degree, but we want more. We want more of you. We want more of your presence, more of your power, more of your character. We say yes to you, Lord God. We say yes to you. We thank you for the multiplicative power that you put on our yeses that just as a little guy gave you uh, some loaves and some fishes and you fed the masses with it. God, that, that when we say yes to you, that you'll use us like that. Supernaturally. We thank you for this supernatural kingdom, this supernatural gospel, this supernatural grace. God, we repent when we've tried to do it in our flesh. We thank you, God. This is a new day, a new experience in you, a new level in you. Bless you, Lord. We honor you. We thank you for what you're doing. We say, Lord Jesus, have your way. Have your way. Bless you, Lord.